turn to page 640, Every Day with Jesus. And a reminder, you're going to have to flip the page as we sing. 640, you got your places, let's all stand. You join us as we sing every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Right across the page there's 639. Turn your eyes on Jesus. Oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, he passed and we follow him there. Over us sin no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. standing open our bibles to exodus chapter 22 the rest of the children are dismissed <laughs> exodus chapter 22 start in verse 1. If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. If a thief be found breaking up or be smiting that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restoration. 
if you have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. If the theft be clearly found, his hand alive, whether it be an ox or an ass or sheep, he shall restore double. If a man shall cause a field or vineyard to be eaten, and shall put in his beast, and shall feed it with another man's field, of another field, and of the best of his own vineyard, shall he make restitution. If fire break out and catch in thorns, so that the stacks of corn, or the standing corn, or the field be consumed therewith, he that kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. If a man shall deliver unto his neighbor money or stuff to keep, and it be stolen out of the man's house, if the thief be found, let him pay double. If the thief be not found, then the master of the house shall be brought unto the judges to see whether he have put his hand into his neighbor's goods. For all manner of trespass, whether it be for ox, for ass, for sheep, for raiment, or for any manner of lost thing, which another challengeth to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges, and whom the judges shall condemn, he shall pay double unto his neighbor. If a man deliver unto his neighbor an ass, or an ox, or a sheep, or any beast to keep, and it die, or be hurt, or driven away, no man seeing it, then shall an oath of the Lord be between them both, that he hath not put his hand unto his neighbor's goods, and the owner of it shall accept thereof, and he shall not make it good. And if it be stolen from him, he shall make restitution unto the owner thereof, if it be torn in pieces, then let him bring it for a witness, and he shall not make good that which was torn. And if a man borrow aught of his neighbor, and it be hurt or die, the owner thereof shall be with him, he shall surely make it good. But if the owner thereof be with it, he shall make, make it good, and if it be hired thing, it can or has hire. And if a man entice a maid that is not betrothed, and lie with her, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. If a father utterly refuse to give her unto him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Whosoever lieth with a beast shall surely be put to death. He that sanctificeth any, any god, save unto the Lord only, he shall be utterly destroyed. Thou shalt neither vex a stranger, nor oppress him, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. And my wrath shall wax hot, and I will kill you with the sword. And your wife shall be widows, and your children fatherless. If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, Thou shalt not be to him as an usher, and shall have lay him usury. If thou take thy neighbor's raiment to pledge, thou shalt deliver it unto him by that sun goeth down. That is a covering only, it is his raiment for his skin, whether in shall he sleep. And shall come to pass, when he crieth unto me, that I will hear, for I am gracious. Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of the people. Shall not delay unto the first of thy ripe fruits and of thy liquors. The firstborn of thy sons shall thou give unto me. Likewise shall thou do with thine oxen and with thy sheep. Seven days it shall be with his name, and the eighth day thou shalt give it to me. And to me, neither shall ye eat any flesh that is torn of beasts in the field. Ye shall cast it to the dogs. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day that you've given us. I pray that you would give us wisdom and strength to get throughout our week for all of us are going to be traveling out i pray that you'd give travel mercies and be with this wedding coming up i pray that you'd guide and direct us and prepare our hearts for what you have today in your name we pray amen you may be seated and take your hymn books turn to page 392 who is on the lord's side 392 Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the King? Who will be His helpers, other lives to bring? Who will leave the world's side? Who will face the foe? Who is on the Lord's side? Who for Him will? By 
thy call of mercy, by thy grace divine. We are on the Lord's side, Savior, we are thine. Not for weight of glory, not for crown and bomb, enter we the army, raise the warrior's song. But for love that claimeth, lives for whom he died, he whom Jesus nameth must be on his side. By thy love constraining, by thy grace divine, we are on the Lord's side, Savior, we are thine. Jesus, thou hast bought us, not with gold or gem, but with thine own life blood for thy diadem. Blessing, feeling, each for to thee. Thou hast made us willing, thou hast made us free. By thy grand redemption, we are on the Lord's side, Savior, we are thine. Fierce may be the conflict, strong may be the foe, but the king's own army none can overthrow. Round his standard ranging, victory is secure, for his truth unchanging makes the triumph sure. Joyfully enlisting by thy grace divine, we are on the Lord's side, Savior, we are thine. And one page back, 391, I am resolved. 391. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have alert my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith, do what he willeth, he is a living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him. A son so glad and free, Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. All right, amen. I appreciate the singing. That's a blessing. 
<clears throat> All right. Any prayer requests this morning? Anything on your heart and mind that we can bring to the Lord? Jason? Jason. Yeah, pray for um, half the church. There's a bunch of folks will be going out this week. My wife, Catherine, AJ. Squish and Caitlin. Casey, are you going? You're going, right? Okay. And, uh, and the Burton ladies as well. So quite a few folks going to be heading out to Michigan to see Jacob and Jenica get married. So that's going to be a special time. I was listening to my brother-in-law Keith preach a little bit today. And uh, he's just a tad bit emotional coming up to the message. And um, I can understand why. You see, when, when you marry... You marry your son off, you get a daughter-in-law. So you gain ground. It's pretty cool. But when you marry your daughter to some guy who then takes her all the way across the country, man, that stinks royal. I'm going to tell you, that's just a bummer. Anyways, so be in prayer for the Hoover family as they, of course, I'm being facetious. Uh, Jacob's a great guy. And um, so you just be in prayer for the family there as uh, they're getting ready. Lots of folks will be coming into Michigan. It's going to be a big wedding, big event, and uh, a lot going on. So pray that the Lord Jesus Christ gets glorified through the whole thing. All right? That's the difference between a wedding and a Christian wedding, or at least ought to be. Okay. Any other prayer requests? Yes, Luke. Oh. Oh, bummer. All right, Samuel. Okay. So pray for a clean bill of health. Yeah. For Isaac. Bobby? Yeah, there are jobs out there, but finding the right one is key, so. Someone else, Casey. I'm sorry, what was the rest of that? Yeah. Well, Casey, you are a Burton. Therefore, by default, all Burtons know how to work on vehicles. The key is the money part. So, by default, Burtons don't necessarily have lots of money. So, it's kind of bringing those two together and working that out. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, someone else. 
All right, Ezekiel chapter 20 in your Bibles. Ezekiel chapter 20. We'll try to wrap this up. I know that it, it seems like I repeat myself often on the importance of the distinction of the church and Israel. But guys, it is so important that we do not confuse this. Your doctrine will hinge on making that distinction. There is no exception to this, guys. There is no middle ground. Um, there are things that we can get along with. In our, and and, and I'm, not, I'm not rude to our Reformed brethren, and I use that term loosely, um, that hold to replacement theology. I'm not. Um, I'll leave that in God's hands. But guys, there are things that we can, we, just, we can agree to disagree on and probably get along just fine and the work of God can continue. But in this area, you're not going to get your doctrine right if you can't make that distinction. Um, uh, in Bible Institute, we were talking about Daniel's 70th week. And um, I think everyone has heard the term Daniel 70th week and you have read Daniel chapter 9 at some point in your Christianity and you've come to a point where Daniel gives a timeline and uh, he, you see several times given there in Daniel chapter 9, you'll see 62 weeks, you'll see 69 weeks, you'll see a time and time and times a time and times and a half and then you're going to see 70 weeks, all right? And essentially what Daniel gives us is the timeline for the history of Israel. And the key is Daniel's 70th week for his people. Now, for years I have looked at that, and Bobby, I am have, I have, um, not a mathematician, Jason, not by any stretch of the imagination. I don't like math. I just like things to be perfect without me having to figure out how to make it perfect. That's what I wanted. I just, you know, I remember growing up with um, the Disney cartoons and, you know, how the, the one guy just kind of magically tells his broom to start sweeping the room. It's the dream of all women. That's why women should never watch Disney. But the point is this. It's like, uh, and then the broom just, boom, and the room is, okay, that's what I want. And I believe heaven will not be that way. But the point is, guys, there is, there is some math in the Word of God. You can't get around it. You've got a whole book called Numbers. So it is it. That's just it. You know? You're going to have to deal with it eventually. And trying to work that math out. Now with Old Testament um, hints, we can see a day for a year in several places. And so when you take that equation and apply it to uh, Daniel's 70th week, you can almost starting with Nehemiah rebuilding uh, Israel, or rebuilding Jerusalem and the temple. And by the way, that is key. The timeline has to start with the rebuild of Jerusalem and the temple, not just the temple. That's why Ezra cannot be the start of the timeline. It's got to be Nehemiah. But when you start there, you can work it out a day for a year with Daniel's weeks up to the crucifixion of Christ. You get 69 weeks. But then you have this gap between the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the 21st century that doesn't work out. And I have, I have smoked my brain to try to work that out. Now because of that gap between that 69th and 70th week, and because people fail to make the distinction between the church and Israel, there are several false doctrines that arise. And one of them is praetorism. And that is the idea that everything has been fulfilled since 70 A.D. And we're in the Millennial Kingdom. If you were in Bible Institute, you already got a little bit of this. But the problem with that is this. Everything that we have experienced since 70 AD to now, it has been observed and recorded and does not fit with the Millennial Kingdom. It doesn't even fit closely unless you attempt to spiritualize. And when you spiritualize the Word of God, anything goes. You can make anything work. But you're not going to actually have clear-cut teaching of Scripture to literally prove that we're in the Millennial Kingdom. You have to spiritualize. You have to say, this means that, this means that. Clouds mean, you know, scorpions. And grass means um, serpents' uh, tails on horses. I mean, that's, you have to play that game 
to make it work. And that's where the praetorists fall flat on their face. They just don't have any scripture to back up their theology. But their failure is in not being able to distinguish Israel from the rest of the world. And it took me a while, not that I believed in praetorism or believed in replacement theology or struggled with that. I just couldn't make the math work. And I tried to work it backwards. I tried to work it forwards. I couldn't make it work until it clicked in my brain. And if you've ever pastored, then you know what I'm talking about. Some things don't come but by time. And it says Daniel's 70th week for his people. And then I realized, oh, a gap is absolutely acceptable because we are not in the time of Israel. We are in the time of the Gentiles. And once I saw that, then the Bible fell into perfect pieces. Now, I'm not giving you the, the, the code for all of the Bible. I'm just going to tell you, you get this doctrine right, you're going to be able to understand doctrine of last things. So when we get to Ezekiel chapter 20, the way God is operating here, though we know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, what he does with his people as opposed to the Gentile people is different. Sure. It's different. He's consistent with his people as he is consistent with the Gentiles and with the church of Lord Jesus Christ. But guys, it's different. And to suggest otherwise is not being honest with the study of the word of God. All right? Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20, let's look at verse 33. As I live, saith the Lord, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out, will I rule over you and I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein you're scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people and there will I plead with you face to face. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. And I will cause you to pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me and I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn and they shall not enter into the land of Israel and ye shall know that I am the Lord. As for you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, go ye, serve everyone as idols and hereafter also. Boy, you ever thought you'd see God saying, serve your idols? It's right there. Here's what you should do. Here's what you should do. You should put this down as a cross-reference. Now, be careful about this because I don't want you to confuse the church in Israel. Well, you should put Revelation chapter 3 in the church of Laodicea because he said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. He did. Here's what God's saying. I want you to get rid of the duplicity. We'll talk about that in just a minute. He said, Go ye, serve ye everyone as idols, and hereafter also, if ye will not hearken unto me, but pollute ye my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. For in mine holy mountain, in the mountain of the height of Israel, saith the Lord God, there shall all the house of Israel, all of them in the land, serve me. There will I accept them. There will I require your offerings and the first fruits of your oblations with your holy things. I will accept you with your sweet Savior, and I will bring you out from the people and gather you out of the countries wherein ye have been scattered, and I will be sanctified in you before the heathen. I like that. Father, bless the short time that we have in your word. I need your help and I need your blessing, Father. We also need your comfort today and an exhortation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're looking at part two of ruled with a rod. Ruled with a rod. Now, we established that when God restores Israel, and the rest of Ezekiel chapter 20 is going to talk about the doctrine of end times, the last days. He's, he's pointing to a new kingdom with the nation of Israel, and it's not Ezra, and it's not Nehemiah, and obviously it's not Babylon, and it's not under Nebuchadnezzar or Darius, all right? It has to be a time where Christ is ruling. There is no exception to looking at this in any other way, guys. Because Christ is not ruling with a rod of iron. Now the Bible says, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And he said that to Israel, and he also said that to the church in the book of Hebrews. So we both get the same 
punishment in some ways. We are grafted into some of Israel's promises. Meaning this, guys, that, that if you as a believer in Jesus Christ, not as a lost man, if you're lost, you are not a child of God, therefore you don't get the punishment and, and, and the discipline that God gives to His children because He loves Him. What you get is the reaping and sowing of your sins. And if you don't turn to Christ, you'll die in your sins and wake up in hell just like the rich man. All right? That's just what the Bible says. But if you're a child of God or you're of the people of God, then the Bible teaches He loves you, God loves you, and He will, he will chasten you. But as of now, it is not with a rod of iron. It is not with a rod of iron. It is often with grace and mercy. Oh, we reap what we sow. But guys, even in our hardest times, I think of what preachers have gone through because uh, they fell flat on their faces. Like you think of um, Jack Scott who blew it big time. He blew it big time. Is the man saved? I think he's saved. And by the way, if you say he's not saved because of his adultery, you had better watch where you're walking, bud. Because last time I checked, you don't have nail prints in your hands. You don't. But you think about it. He's going to go to prison. He went to prison, what, 14 years? Is he getting ready to come out soon? He's out. He's out. All right. Maybe serve good behavior. I've got to tell you something, guys. That punishment that he got, and after that, still, he experiences the mercy and grace of God. Sure. Because he's a child of God. So it ain't fair. Oh, no, I promise you there have been many a nights he sat in prison going, what an idiot I am. Yeah. And when he got out... He got to experience grace and mercy. And even while he was in, he probably got to experience grace and mercy just like you do every single day. Right. We are not under the rod of iron. That rod of iron, when it comes down, it breaks you in pieces. All right? It's pretty rough. And this is not it. This is not it. So when he restores Israel, and this is not Ezra and Nehemiah, when he restores Israel, it will be with power. It will be with a mighty hand. It will be a stretched out arm. We talked about this already. A stretched out arm refers to his ability to reach into the impossible. Uh, it will be with fury poured out. And it will be uh, with a rod of iron. Now, before he exacts the rod of iron, we talked about this last week. In Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 35, he will plead with Israel. This is God's grace. Now, we can see similarities to how much God has given us. We're still not Israel, but I can tell you, we can see some of that. Before you get written off, guys, God gives you plenty of chances. And hey, we'll talk about that, Lord willing, this morning in the next service. But he will plead with them, and then he will rule with a rod of iron. Look at Ezekiel 20 and verse 37. Ezekiel 20 and verse 37. I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. Now, of course, this is not the only place to reference Christ ruling Israel with a rod of iron. All right, go to Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2 in your Bibles. You should have Psalm 2 memorized. Psalm chapter 2. Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together, saith the Lord, and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. He shall speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, and I will declare the decree. The Lord has said, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And Psalms 2 is pointing to a future event of ruling and ruling with a rod of iron. And the, 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 the fruit of that rod coming down is broken in pieces, or being broke in pieces. And by the way, Psalm 2 is, is in light of those who set themselves above God. Interesting to note, the Lord will laugh at their arrogance. Uh, he won't put up with that. A rod of iron, guys, God is going to be rigid. He's going to be strict. And it's not going to have as much grace and mercy as he once had for us. This is why this is the time to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, Jesus will confirm his power and authority in speaking to the church at Thyatira. But in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5, 
He said this, and she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And Revelation 19, verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And this passage points to the moment the Lord Jesus delivers in fury. Ezekiel just talked about that. He's going to restore Israel, but he's going to restore a mighty hand, and he's going to deliver them in fury. What's he going to do? He's going to cut the enemies of Israel and God in half with that sword that comes out of his mouth. And then when he comes down to sit on the throne, he's going to establish a rigid set of laws that they must follow. If they don't follow, God will come down on them with strictness. Now, i got to tell you something. This ruling with a rod of iron is a response to generations, I believe, of rebellion towards God. Rebellion towards God. Israel, since the day they came out of Egypt, have been, have been rejecting God instantly upon hearing the commandments. Almost instantly. I mean, it wasn't just a few chapters after he gives them the Ten Commandments that they build a golden calf. And, and, they, and, and then they dance around it and, and start the first rock concert in the Bible. And, and, then, and then you got Aaron standing there going, I don't even know what happened. <laughs> it just happened. The drug addict response of all the ages. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I'm a wreck. My whole life's a wreck. Yeah, you, you made that golden calf, bud. It's amazing to me how much grace God gave Aaron. I would, I would have rolled my eyes and then killed him. <laughs> you know, think about that. But anyways, so this moment is a response. This kingdom is a response to years and years of rebellion towards God. Now I'm going to tell you, being ruled by Jesus Christ with a rod of iron is far greater than being ruled by the Antichrist. And here's the reason why. Because the Antichrist is going to set a covenant with Israel, and then he's going to turn around and try to kill them all. Just because. Now you say, why would he try to kill all of God's people? Because they're God's chosen people. Just like God keys on the oldest child in the, or the excuse me, God keys on the oldest child and the devil keys on the oldest child. Isn't that true in every home? It seems like your biggest battles are with the oldest child. You say, well, it's because you're just learning. No, it's because the devil wants them because the oldest child always belonged to God. Right? It's the same thing with God's people. People hate the Jews and they don't even know why. Muslims are born with this great hatred for the Jews and they couldn't even tell you why. They've just been raised since the day they could walk to hate the Jews. Where'd that come from? Well, it came from the devil's crowd. And why hate the Jews? They were willing to roll out the red carpet for the Antichrist and literally let him set in the temple. The abomination of desolation, right? In the temple. And then he turns on him and wants to kill them all. Why? Because the Antichrist is the devil's crowd and they hate God's people. Even if God's people are rebellion towards him, they still hate him just for the fact that they're identified with God's people. Think of it this way. And here's something we'll spiritualize for just a moment. You're a saved child of God. In your rebellion, God still wants to ruin you. Never forget that. Even when you walk away from God, He wants to kill you. He does. Not like just set back. No, He'd rather kill you because you're a child of God. Same thing with the people of Israel. All right, so this rod of iron is established. This is a future event. Let's look at verse 38. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 38. Now remember, He is ruling with fury. He's going to plead with them. He's going to roll with a rod of iron. Then He's going to weed out the rebels. Ezekiel 20, verse 38. And I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn. And they shall not enter into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Again, I believe he will do this both in the tribulation and during the millennial kingdom. Jesus confirms this in the gospels. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 12, he said, Whose fan is in his hand... And he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The unquenchable fire is considered a parable by the end of the chapter, by the way, in Ezekiel chapter 20, which we're going to look at in just a couple minutes. A parable by many who find hell distasteful. 
regardless, it is no less true. So he's going to weed out the rebels. Now, there's something to be learned here. Remember, we've got the historical, we've got the doctrinal part, but there's always a spiritual and inspirational message for us to learn because all the Old Testament is just as needful to us in the New Testament as the New Testament is. So we can learn from the Old Testament. You look what God does in ruling the nation of Israel. He rules with a rod of iron. He pleads with them first. So he's not just going to put down the hammer on these people without instructing them as he had done for years and years and years. But when he sets up this new kingdom, this millennial kingdom, he's going to rule them. But first plead with them, do right. Please do right this time. Do right this time. This is what you've got to do. Do right. Then he's going to rule them with a rod of iron. And here's what he does. He gets rid of the, the problem childs. He's going to weed out the rebels. If this isn't parenting, I don't know what is. Think about this. As parents, you should do the same thing. Now, I'm not saying you get yourself a rod of iron. Bob's already clear about what you use for discipline. But you plead with your children. You teach them what is right. You've got to instruct them. And you ask them to do right. Then you bring the hammer down if they do not. And you get particular about who they associate with. There's nothing wrong with that. And it's not being arrogant at all. My dad, he had this standard. It was no um, sleepovers. This is one of those things. No sleepovers. No sleepovers. Um, and the reason why is because in the early years, you know, it was sleepovers that you see your first pornography. It's your sleepovers where the kids talk about things they shouldn't be talking about. Well, they got to learn somewhere. Hey, let them learn from mom and dad not from the rebels. And God said, I'm going to weed them out. In fact, I'm going to make sure they don't get to go into Israel. You're out. You don't get to come over. You're fired. Now, this weeding, of course, is going to be a whole lot worse because it's going to be with an unquenchable fire. Remember, he's ruling with a rod of iron. And you're not doing right. He's going to come down and he's going to kill him. You're out. So, yeah, you're not going to kill your neighbor's kids because they, you know, introduce Star Wars or DC Comics or something like that. But guys... Um, you, can, you can kill the moment by saying, no, you're not talking about that, or you're not playing that. You're not going here, okay? Right? Yes. The door is shut. You walk in and open the door. These are principles that should be established in every home. Well, it's, you, you act like you don't trust your children. No, it's not that I don't trust my children. The Bible says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, and, and since the, the Bible says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, I don't trust the foolishness in them. That's all. I love them to death. Just leave the door open. Yeah, but they're Christians. Leave the door open, right? Amen. Amen. So there's a lesson to be learned, not just the historical. The historical is, this is what God's going to do. It's going to be a whole lot harsher than you'll ever be. But you know what? Do you some good and your children some good to be a little bit harsher? <coughs> well, I've got to love them. Listen, the Bible says if you don't discipline your child, you hate them. The lack of discipline in your home reveals your hatred for your child. Amen. Amen. And that goes for the girls and boys. All right, amen. All right. Okay, look at this one. Look at verse 39. Verse 39, Ezekiel 20, verse 39. As for you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, Go ye, serve ye every one his idols, and hereafter also, if ye will not hearken unto me, but pollute ye my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. So here's the third thing he wants to do. He wants to get rid of the duplicity. Get rid of the duplicity. Stop being both sides of the fence. All right? You walk that narrow road. They ever hear people say, don't sit on the fence? I don't know. It's... I, I think it's more like you're either on one side or the other. But the walk of God is usually right down the middle. you got the extremist on both sides. It's always that way. Truth is always right smack down the middle. But the extremists call that compromise. Isn't it true? Isn't it true? You'll find truth is always that way. It's not extreme to the left or the right. It's right down the middle. It is narrow. It's rigid. But the extremists want you in their camps one way or the other, and, and, and they'll intimidate you just a little bit. Sure. He says, stop being duplicitous. Here it is. He says, go serve your idols if you will not. Oh, listen to me. If you're not going to listen to me, if you're not going to obey me, then go serve Buddha. Go serve Muhammad. Go do that. He says, but 
this is how you pollute my name. Pollute ye my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. I get a little nervous about, you know, uh, Catholics who come up to me and say, boy, I, th- I appreciate your work at that church. I'd like to give you, you know, uh, want to help out and give you gifts, you know. want to, want to be a blessing to you. Now, I could look at it this way because I'm a Baptist and think, well, hey, I just took money away from the devil. <laughs> or it could be you're just taking money from the devil. <laughs> Baptists are opportunists in all ways. I just, I can work it out, guys. Promise me. I promise you, I can work it out. <laughs> Casino walks up. We want to just bless the church with $30,000. And the Baptist in me says, is it cash? <laughs> yes. Perfect. Thank you. Here's the thing. He says, stop playing both sides. If you're going to worship idols, worship idols and leave me alone. That's what God's saying here. Now, here's what the Lord did. He's gone into the present again. So first, he's in the future. And he's talking about the restoration of Israel. Now he's talking to Israel in time. And he wants them to do one thing or the other, just like with the Laodicean church. Be hot or cold. But how many of us are that way, though? One day we're on fire for God, and one day we're dead as a hammer. God said, be be one or the other, but stop playing both sides. Stop playing both sides. And he said, no more gifts for the Lord alongside of their idol worship. The Lord doesn't need the devil's money in order to make it through this life. Right? Amen. I like that. Uh, You know, um, it reminds me of in the New Testament, Jesus Christ said, if you have aught with your brother, he says, leave your gift at the altar and go reconcile with your brother. Right? Then go offer your gift. Now, it's not that the gift didn't belong there. The gift still belongs to God. But he said, before you go give what belongs to God with the wrong heart, go fix what's wrong with you and your brother. Now, see, we can, we can learn from the Old Testament. This is instruction to the nation of Israel. But Jesus Christ reminds us how important it is to have the right heart. You realize the reason why you won't reconcile with your brother is because you worship yourself. And that would be idolatry still. So so here's what he does. He wants them to put away the duplicity. He sets, he sets a standard for what he will accept. Look at verse 40. For in my holy mountain, in the mountain of the height of Israel, saith the Lord God, there shall all the house of Israel, all of them in the land, serve me. There will I accept them, and there will I require your offerings and the first fruits, first fruits of your oblations with all your holy things. Here's what he's saying. In my mountain, you serve me. All of Israel serves me. Okay, he says, I want the first fruits, I want the offerings. He said, but I want you to serve me, not half in, half out. He said, I will accept you with your sweet savor when I bring you out from the people and gather you out of the countries wherein you have been scattered, and I will be sanctified in you before the heathen. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I shall bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for which I lifted up mine hand to give it to your fathers. Remember, we already defined what lifting up my hand means. This is not lifting up the hand to deliver. This is lifting up the hand to swear, to promise. He says, so, so he says, listen, when I bring you in according to what I promised, this is what I expect out of you. Not worshiping the idols. I'm not sharing my time with idols with you. You're going to give me your offerings. You're going to give me your first fruits. And you're going to know that I am the Lord. You're going to do this for me because I kept my promise. I, I pulled you out of that country and brought you back to the land of Israel. I promised that. I lifted up my hand. Look at verse 43, and there shall you remember your ways. I like this, and all your doings where ye in ye have been defiled, and ye shall build yourselves up in your own sight. <clears throat> That's not what he says. Ye shall loathe yourselves. This is interesting. There shall you remember your ways, and all your doings wherein you have been defiled. And you shall read books, self-help books on self-esteem so that you won't feel bad about your past. No, he says, I want you to remember and hate what you did and hate yourself for doing it. It ought to sicken you just a little bit. Now, when we get the New Testament, Paul gives us a little bit of grace and he says, forgetting those things which are behind. Right? 
forgetting those things. We can't dwell in the past. We're in the Old Testament and he is ruling with a rod of iron or he's establishing that he will rule with a rod of iron. He said, look, I want you to stop being duplicitous. I want you to come out of, Israel, uh, come out of these pagan nations and know that I brought you out. I delivered you. And I want you to remember what you did. And you ought to feel bad just a little bit. Right? That you'll loathe yourselves in your own sight for all your evils that ye have committed. He's not promoting self-esteem or PMA, positive mental attitude. Amen. I think sometimes we kind of get the idea that um, there is no reaping and sowing because of God's grace. There's always reaping and sowing, guys. There's always reaping and sowing. And, and you know what? God's grace allows you to be able to endure when you are reaping what you sowed. Uh, there's a preacher, um, Brother David Spurgeon. I don't know if you've ever heard him before. He'll be preaching up at Brother Dutton's um, in a couple weeks. I love Brother Spurgeon. He's not eloquent. Um, never been eloquent. All the cocaine he snorted blew out his brain. And he committed great crimes and, and, and really messed up. But he got saved in, in jail and got right with God, got on fire for God, started preaching, and the judge ruled that he would have to preach on probation. And as far as I know, it's still indefinite. He's, he's been seeking a pardon. He was hoping to get one when, when Trump was in office, and he never got it, But um, he because uh, he's still considered a felon. But um, the man will tell you this. His struggles with keeping a clear mind and being able to articulate and, and just in his later years now from all he said those struggles come from my years of sin and he said I'm reaping what I sow sure. but God gives me the grace to get through it each day and that's the mercy of God yeah. mercy of God allows for you to say yeah I blew it here I deserve what I'm getting and I'll still be faithful to God in my in my punishment amen I know this is teaching time but well you can't help but learn some things right right gain some ground in this. You messed up, you messed up, you pay for it. Sure. How many of you ever made a purchase and it, and it was, in, and, and it was you used a charge card and you messed up and then you broke whatever it was? So you, you put yourself in debt to get it and then it breaks down and now, I've seen people do that. They bought brand new cars. My dad told me this and I still have yet to buy a brand new car on credit, right? That's just one smart thing I've ever done in my life. One. Just one, okay? Don't give me any credit at all, just one. But I've seen people buy a brand new vehicle on credit, they're making payments, and then they wreck the vehicle. And you're like, well, that was a bad investment, right? It was. And you know what God will do? He'll give you the grace to pay it off and get through it. That's the God of all comfort. And I love him. I love him for that that he comes through for us when we make boneheaded decisions God, and he helps us walk through it. Come on. Hallelujah. Now preach. That's a good God. Yes, sir. Never did that. Amen. All right, we better stop. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Yes, Lord. We thank you for giving us the grace to endure. And it's not endure for salvation. You've already saved us. Yes. It's to endure the hard times. To endure even our mistakes. Lord, help us now to serve you faithfully in the midst of what we have to face. Lord, help us to honor you faithfully this day, the Lord's day, as we assemble together because of your grace. In Jesus' name.